Oh, well, I'm Amanda Trum. I'm the curator of collections here at the Montana Historical Society. And I want to say up front, I hope that you all feel comfortable um, in just asking questions or making comments throughout. So I think that'll be more fun than if I just stand up here and lecture at you. Of course, I understand if you don't want to say anything, that's fine too. But feel free to say, uh, make comments or whatever throughout the presentation. So uh, today we're going to be talking about Roz Chast and Stan Lind. Um, of course, uh, they're cartoonists. Um, Roz Chast uh, worked for the works, does still work for the New Yorker. She has also written several books and illustrated several books, um, including uh, Can't We Talk About Something More Pleasant, which was chosen by the National Endowment for the Arts as a big read book. And um, I should say that Suzanne, I just asked you how to pronounce your name, and I'm just... Switzenberg. Switzenberg. I've been pronouncing it wrong in my head this whole time, so yeah. So Suzanne is from the Lewis and Clark Library, and she brought a bunch of books um, to give away. So if you haven't gotten one of those copies yet, then please uh, grab one on your way out. Um, yeah, and I wanted to ask, has anyone read that book or any of Roz's other books? Oh, great. Yeah. Does anyone have um, a subscription to The New Yorker? Nice. Nice. So yeah, do you remember like her cartoons popping up here and there? Sure. <laughs> well, you know, did you go to her talk when she was here? No, I was on the show. So um, I thought it was really funny. She showed, I think she showed, I've seen anyway, her first um, New Yorker publication, and I did not get it either. I was. <laughs> I, I thought that that was a really strange one. She just had a bunch of um, little, I think it was called Small Things, the title, Little Things. And it was just like a bunch of different things that she drew that looked like they should be something, but really weren't anything. So anyway, that was her start to her, uh, her cartooning career, I guess. But I wanted to pass around um, these printouts. So as far as I know, this is the only cartoon that, um, here, I'll give it to you and then you guys can pass it back and forth. This is the only cartoon that Roz Chast has done of Montana. So <laughs> it's kind of hard to read. I know it's a little bit blurry, but you can tell me what you think about it later. And then of course we're talking about Stan Lind, who is um, a legend and um, everyone's favorite Montanan probably. So um, he grew up in Lodgegrass, Montana on the Crow Reservation. His most widely read and popular comic strip was Ricochet, but he had also created several others, um, including Latigo, Pardners, Grassroots, and a couple of strips that ran only in Sweden, which is funny. They love cowboys over there. So um, they were called Chief Sly Fox and Rovar Bob, which means Bad Bob. He also wrote nine novels, and he won a Spur Award for one of them. Um, he actually read uh, for the audiobook. He did the narration for that. So um, that was for Vendetta Canyon. Has anyone read any of his novels? Yeah, about the same. Different people, though, I think. Yeah. So I guess, you know, one thing that I would say about them is that they, they both write about and draw topics that they know well, which makes them successful. Um, they're funny and they're poignant because they're true to life, and we can relate to them. Um, I think they've, they've proven to have wide appeal, and it doesn't matter uh, where you live in the country or what life experiences you've had, um, people still find them to be really popular. And you probably all know Stan Line died in 2013, um, but he was creating art up until that time, and um, afterwards, if you want to take a look, I've got what is probably one of his last sketches. Hi, come on in. So here we have some adorable kid photos. Um, so uh, Stan Lind was born in 1931. He was 23 years old when Roz Chast was born in 1954. Um, but they actually ended up living in New York City at the same time from 1956 to 1962. So Stan Lind had moved to the city to kind of jumpstart his career. Um, so he did that with Ricochet, and once he kind of established himself there, then he fled back to Montana. And then um, it's interesting, too, 
Roz got her start at The New Yorker in 1978, which happened to be the same year that Stan Line stopped working on Ricochet. And I don't know if you remember, there was a little bit of controversy about that um, because he could not come to an agreement about their contract um, with the Chicago syndicate. And so they ended up just dumping him and they picked up a guy, I can't remember his last name, but his first name was Alfredo. So Alfredo tried to take over Ricochet, and he did that for a couple of years, but of course, it wasn't Stan Lines, and he didn't know what he was talking about, so it kind of fell through. So of course, they had um, very different childhoods. Um, Stan, of course, grew up in a very rural area. Uh, he had, I think, a pretty carefree, um, independent lifestyle. Uh, he and his family often lived in um, sheep herders' wagons in the summer because they tended sheep. He uh, shot his first gun at age six, and he, <laughs> he was with um, cowboy Bill Mills, who he said later um, he used Bill and his father as like uh, the, the real people behind hip shot. Um, of course, he spent a lot of time with cowboys, and um, <laughs> you know, I have to say, he, has anyone read his account of shooting that gun at age six? Yeah, so it's kind of funny because he said that it made him cry. It knocked him on his butt and made him cry, but then he said it was also one of the best experiences of his life. So, <laughs> And then um, Roz Chast grew up in Brooklyn, New York, and even though she grew up in a really urban setting, um, her life was uh, very sheltered and oppressed, and I think most of that was because of her mother. Her mother. Um, so I just think, I just wanted to point out the, uh, the expression on her face there. So, you know, I mean, she looks absolutely miserable, but I guess to be fair, um, that could be any teenager <laughs> standing next to his or her mother at any point in human history, so I guess we have to understand that. Um, but one kind of interesting story that she had, just to give you a little glimpse into her life, was that um, she was not allowed to walk to and from school. So she had had a series of adult women babysitters um, in, in her childhood. And so the babysitter was required to walk her to school every day and then walk her home at, um, in the afternoon. And on top of that, uh, she was not allowed, her mother would not allow her to have lunch with the kids at school. So she was worried that she would catch something from those germy kids and so, the babysitter also had to walk her home to have lunch with her in her house and then walk her back. So that must have been kind of traumatic. Um, but one thing that they had in common was that their parents were very supportive of their drawing and they both used it as a happy outlet, I think. Oh, I forgot to mention that on the title page, those two um, drawings were self-portraits. So that's kind of fun. So we have here another couple of self-portraits. Uh, Stan Lines drew this one when he was 16 years old of himself. You can see it was done in 1947. And then Roz did this one as an adult um, of her nine-year-old self. And the story that she told about this one, I think, is that um, a publisher, somebody had asked her for a photo of her as a kid, and she couldn't lay hands on one right away, so she just drew a picture instead. But um, but it is kind of interesting, you can see she, um, I don't know if you can read any of her, the, the titles of her books, but at this point she was developing uh, pretty severe anxiety and hypochondria. Um, she, yeah, so here she's reading the big book of horrible rare diseases, and, <laughs> and she's got diseases of the tropics here, and Lockjaw Monthly, which she subscribed to. And, um, so she also talks about how her parents, um, they would only eat out at one restaurant um, in the city and it happened to be a Chinese restaurant that was a block from their house. And so she said that that was the only one that was safe. And then on top of that, they could only order a certain thing there and that was the only thing that was safe in that safe restaurant. So. Um, her father was also a very anxious person. Her mother was a germaphobe, obviously. So you can imagine what that would do you know, to her personality um, and her life in general. She has said that she prefers cities to nature. And she loves what she calls density of visual information, which, of course, the city would provide. 
Um, Stan, on the other hand, uh, has described himself as a Westerner by birth and inclination. He has also talked a lot about the different types of homes in which he has lived. He has said every kind of dwelling you can imagine, from a sheep wagon to a tent, dugout, line shack, cabin, and ranch house. And I think it's also very important to note that he earned Boy Scout merit badges in horsemanship and art. So, so I think generally he had a hardworking but a very happy childhood. And um, so I think it's pretty obvious that their success is tied to their deep um, connection to their homelands. And um, so it's kind of ironic. They both made, uh, I think, traitorous moves. So Stan Line did not like to talk about the fact that he had moved to New York City. Um, and then Roz Chass, later when she started having kids, she and her husband and the kids moved to the Connecticut suburbs. So very scandalous. So here we have a montage of some of Chass cartoons. Um, there are numerous and obvious differences, I think, um, between uh, their cartoons. Uh, two of the main categories, of course, are the subject matter and also the physical execution of, of the cartoons. Um, of course, I've picked illustrations here that help me make my point. She did actually, <laughs> she did actually draw some happy faces once in a while. Um, but I do think that this is a fair representation of her work. I think it's also fair to say that she was generally writing from and drawing from a place of insecurity. We've talked a little bit about what her childhood was like. Um, so she, she definitely illustrates a very fast-paced, stressful, anxiety-ridden life. Um, the other thing that's just kind of interesting and is that she, she says that she loves to draw interiors. And so here we have, um, it's small, but that's a classic kind of interior that she likes to draw. She also happens to love lamps, so she likes to draw lamps a lot. Um, so you can see here, her cartoons are very uh, loose and free-flowing. They're almost like just quick sketches. And uh, so she had mentioned, um, I think this, was, this must have been at her um, presentation here in Helena, she said that the New Yorker staff uh, gets together on Wednesdays to kind of talk about the content of the magazine. And um, she said that she really likes to work under pressure because she doesn't work on her cartoons until Monday or Tuesday. So um, maybe that's part of it. She's, you know, she needs to draw quickly. So I had come across an article um, in the New York Times uh, by a woman named Alex Witchell, and she had described um, Chass cartoons as illustrating hopeless reality. So I thought that was really interesting. Um, and you know, I don't know that Roz Chass would, would think that this illustration represents hopeless reality in her life, but does anyone recognize this big bottom cartoon? So it's from um, the book, Can't We Talk About Something More Pleasant? And this one just kind of cracks. I mean, they all crack me up, but this one is really funny, I think. She is talking about when um, her parents have moved into a nursing home, and she goes to visit them, and they're all having lunch together. And her father uh, mentions that he would like to eat some olives, and so he's trying to figure out how many olives he should eat. So he, de he decides on four. He's going to have four olives. And then um, her mother looks at him kind of with a glare and says, why don't you start with one and see how it goes? So this is ridiculous, of course, right? I mean, he's not talking about he's healthy, you know, healthy enough to decide what he's going to eat. So it's kind of silly that they're arguing over one olive versus four. So then, of course, this is really irritating Roz, and she says, can I just say something? If dad could pick his own number of olives, this would be a non-issue. And of course, they both look at her and say, who asked you? So, so that's kind of like a typical conversation that she would have with them. And then we have some Stan Line cartoons. You probably recognize some of these characters. Um, Let's see. So I would say, you know, where Roz Chass is coming from um, a place of insecurity, I would say that, or argue that Stan Line is coming from more of a bedrock of moral surety. Um, his cartoons often have a moral to the story. 
Um, and I think he has loftier ideas of reality, but they're still true to life. He obviously illustrates um, a slower moving, kind of can do, keep calm, and carry on with life attitude. I think that's most often exemplified in his character, Hipshot. He, of course, loves to draw the western landscape and the great outdoors. Um, his cartoons, you know, in terms of execution, you can see uh, generally are very cleanly drawn and precise. Um, so, yeah, it's, it's kind of interesting. We have, I don't know if you know, but um, in 2012, Stan and his wife, Linda, donated their entire collection of personal materials um, that they had had from his career to the Montana Historical Society. And so um, I think some of the greatest pieces in the collection are notes and things that he has written to people that he's worked with. And so at one point, um, he, he worked with a man named Denny Neville. And at that time, this was during the 1970s, and they would have um, uh, people that were known as inkers. And so um, he was always under strict deadlines um, to get the job done quickly, to crank out the cartoons for the next issue um, of the newspaper. And so um, at first when he started, he would do all the work himself. Um, but then as time went on, he ended up hiring Denny. And Denny, as an inker, would draw or write in all of the text in the speech balloons. And so we have some notes that Stan has written to Denny saying things like, that looks a little bit off, do that one over again. And he's talking about you know, the, the slight variations in the um, like italicized words versus not and things like that. So very, very precise. Um, uh, all of the lines are in perfect position, which is exactly where Stan wants them to be. And I would say if we're, if we're describing Ra's Chass work as hopeless reality, I think it's fair to say that we could describe Stan Line's work as hopeful reality. Although, now that I've said that, I think here are a few cartoons that don't seem all that hopeful to me, but they're still funny. So, and I really didn't mean to um, stand up here and read cartoons to you, but this is just kind of the nature of it, so we're gonna have to do that a little bit. Um, so this is from a series uh, called Grassroots that he did in the 1990s. Um, so over here we've got um, Billy uh, is talking about this kid and he's talking about her shoes and their air pumps and they have gel inserts and they have everything but a CD player. And he says, footwear is a true status symbol. And then Shag, um, the guy standing next to him, says, when I was a kid, just owning a pair of shoes gave us status. And then the next one over is, remember when the kids were afraid of the principal? So I know this is a little bit blurry, but you can see we've got some kind of hard-looking high schoolers here. And they clearly are not afraid of the principal. And then down the line a little bit, he definitely um, talked about politics. Uh, we've got um, Billy sitting on the bed reading a newspaper that says scandal widens with what is clearly an image of Bill Clinton on the cover. Um, <laughs> and then so uh, Shag says, yep, and um, most, oh wait, he says, uh, the president sure has his troubles these days, don't he? And um, Shag says, yep, and most of them are self-inflicted. And then we've got another one here, too, as he's reading the newspaper. Same thing, Bill Clinton on the cover, scandalous. Um, and then he says, there's a lesson in all of this, Billy. Never vote for a politician whose name is tricky or slick. Um, so I think he, he discusses politics a lot in this series in particular. Um, but I think he does it in a way that's appealing and palatable to everyone, um, which is difficult to do. Um, he doesn't overtly take sides. He's just generally kind of against and wary of politics and politicians. So it's something that we can all kind of get behind sometimes. Um, religion uh, is also a major theme in his comics. And then here we have some Chass cartoons. So over here, her title is Turf War on West 49th Street. And uh, the man is holding a sign that says, the end is near for religious reasons. And the woman is holding a sign that says, the end is near for ecological reasons. <laughs> and then next we have the fountain of puberty, which just looks awful. Lots of pimply and stinky kids. Um, 
And then uh, prayers for agnostics. And so these agnostics are starting their prayers by saying things like this, heavenly whatever, on the off chance that you're there. <laughs> and then to the powers that might or might not be. And then the last one is, uh, sorry in advance for being so bad at believing, but. <laughs> and then I think this is a really good one too. We have the three ages of man. So you're either younger than your doctor, you're the same age as your doctor, or you're older than your doctor. <laughs> so she, um, she seems to completely avoid politics. Has anyone seen any of her, her cartoons where she talks about politics at all? I tried finding some, actually, and I couldn't, so I, I don't know. I think she just maybe generally avoids it. Although, obviously, she does participate in um, social commentary and religion in a broad way. Um, she often discusses mundane, everyday topics, but she makes us look at them in a slightly different way, and they become funny. And, that, you know, of course, they both joke about generational differences because that's always funny. So here we have a couple of typical subjects for each artist, I think. Um, so I won't read every word, but over here we have Roz Chast, um, and she's titled this Sherlock Holmes, MD. So Roz uh, is talking to her mother on the phone, and her mother says, how am I? I still have the cold, but I can't figure out how I caught it. And then she goes through a series of um, uh, cartoon blocks trying to figure out how she got this cold. Was it this person or that person or this place or that place? And then finally at the end she says, wait a minute, I know, the supermarket. <laughs> so, you know, I mean, it's just kind of funny. She is making fun of her parents, as usual, um, her mother's obsession over how exactly she got her cold, which I think I know I am totally guilty of doing. Um, you know, sometimes you just need somebody to blame when you're not feeling well, so. Um, so, yeah, normally that's a, a very mundane kind of conversation, and if you were having it with someone you knew, you probably would be bored stiff with it, but it's funny here. And then we have um, Ricochet, and what's happening is Rick and his family are in church, and then they leave the church after the sermon, and Rick notices a man who he hasn't seen in a while. So he goes over to Jeb, and he says, Jeb, I haven't, I haven't seen you in a while, but it's good to see you, but it's also surprising, too. And um, Jeb says, how's that, Marshall? And um, Rick says, I've known you for almost 10 years now, but I just never knew you were a Christian. And Jeb says, well, yeah, I'm sort of sorry to hear that, because if you couldn't tell, I must be doing something wrong. So, um, you know, he's highlighting the church-going culture, I guess, but also showing that people have different ways of expressing their spirituality. Um, and you're probably familiar with Hipshot being one of those characters. So um, he has different iterations of Hipshot um, riding past the church as everybody else is going in, and then he kind of rides off into the mountains, and he finally gets to a certain spot in the mountains, and he takes off his hat, and he looks up and says, hi, boss, I'm sorry I'm late, but I knew that you were busy with those folks in the church. So um, I, think, I think that Jeb is a sympathetic character here. Hipshot obviously is. Um, so, you know, we can probably relate to that, too. Um, we know people, or we are people ourselves, who do things um, that are a little bit outside the norm, but they're still valid ways of living our life. So... Um, I wanted to talk a little bit about, just a little bit about storytelling. So there are lots of um, rules, I guess, for how to be a good writer, how to be a good storyteller. And they always include things like knowing your audience and engaging them, making them care about your topic and being authentic. And I think they clearly do that for us. Um, both artists are able to illuminate the human condition and psyche. And at the same time, they're, they're physically able to illustrate what they're talking about. Um, so we've all heard the phrase, a picture is worth a thousand words, and I think that probably um, was meant for photographs, which are very detailed, but at the same time, um, Roz and Stan had to create their own detail. Um, so I think it's uh, remarkable that they achieve the level of detail and emotion that they do with um, what amounts to a few lines on paper. So I wanted to point out, I know that this is a little bit fuzzy, but I just love her mother's expression in this last 
Um, in this last panel, you, you know exactly, we've probably all felt that way before, um, you know, like you finally got to the bottom of it. And so I think she just, you know, with the way that she drew her eyebrows, I think it's just perfect. So in, um, in the book, Can't We Talk About Something More Pleasant, I noticed that, of course, um, all of the words are uh, in her handwriting. And um, it's kind of sloppy sometimes. And there, I did notice a couple of mistakes, actually, um, just you know, where maybe she didn't really scribble something out. But, you know, but it was left there. Um, I think it makes it more endearing and charming. Um, and of course, uh, you know, Stan Lyne's writing is very precise. Um, he accepted only perfection. We had talked about the notes to Denny Neville saying, fix that one little line. Um, and then, you know, Stan, uh, I think this would have been in the late 1980s or early 1990s, he was able to use um, computer font instead of having to write everything out himself. And so he decided to use that. And you can see, not sure if we have, yeah, I think we do here. Um, I have examples of, you know, so he would type this stuff up on the computer, print it out, and then cut it out and glue it to his um, illustration. So that would make it a little bit easier. Um, so I think, you know, he obviously decided to use computer font because it was easier and faster. But I would say he probably always wanted to do that as well because it was perfect. There was no um, deriding Denny because he didn't get the, the letters right. And then so I think it's interesting that, um, of course, Chast has access to all sorts of computer fonts, but she chooses to write everything out um, herself and even um, leaving mistakes in place. So I, I guess I just wanted to say that, you know, we've talked about this a little bit, but even though their individual styles are very different, the underlying thread of commonality between Roz Chast and Stan Lined um, is that they're great storytellers. They're good at making us care and feel invested so that we can't wait to turn the page to see what happens. Um, they're adept at helping us understand and appreciate life and in some instances uh, cope with difficult or big topics. Um, and they do that through relatable cartoons. So I found this um, partial quote from a review of Roz Chast's book, Going Into Town, A Love Letter to New York, but I think it applies directly to Stan Lined as well. Um, so the reviewer said, it's all delivered with obvious and knowing affection and captured with a keenly observant pen. Do you have any other thoughts about their works? <laughs> 